Welcome to the first global news podcast of 2018, compiled in the early hours of Monday the 1st of January. I'm Alex Ritson. The new year has officially begun in many countries across the globe, Samoa being the first. Some of the world's major festivities took place in Sydney. Dubai saw the traditional fireworks replaced by a laser show from the top of the world's tallest building, Burj Khalifa. And in Jakarta, in Indonesia, 500 couples got married in a mass wedding. Coming up in this edition are a selection of highlights from across BBC World Service News. Water cannon and internet restrictions in Iran as President Rouhani speaks out on the fourth day of anti-government protests. People are free to express their criticism and to protest. However, we need to pay attention to the manner of our criticism and protest. President Xi announces China's intention to play a greater role on the world stage. As a responsible major country, China must speak out. Plus, Sesame Street plans to entertain children who fled the war in Syria. These characters will reflect a child's reality. They're not the U.S. version of the show. But first, four days after widespread protests against the government began in Iran, President Rouhani has finally spoken in public about the matter. He told a cabinet meeting that any demonstration should be conducted in a way that served the best interests of the whole country. It should be clear to everyone that we are people of freedom, and according to the Constitution and citizens' rights, people are free to express their criticism and to protest. However, we need to pay attention to the manner of our criticism and protest. It should be in such a way that it will lead to the improvement of the people and the state. Meanwhile, police in the capital, Tehran, used water cannon to disperse protesters and in an attempt to control demonstrations, the authorities restricted access to a popular social media messaging app. I asked Kazra Naji of BBC Persian what he made of Mr Rouhani's words. I don't think they are going to satisfy many of the protesters tonight or calm the situation down. These are the words that... Iranian leaders have been using before. People have seen it. They've been there. They've done that kind of thing. Frankly, the situation is far more serious. It needs a lot more attention than just saying that, oh, we have problems, of course, but we have to work together to resolve these issues. He said, for example, we have problems, but as many of these problems date back to many years ago. He's referring to the international sanctions against Iran because of Iran's nuclear program. People have heard that before. People want to put that behind them. And these words are not going to satisfy them, I don't think. So we've now had four straight days of anti-government demonstrations. Are they getting bigger? They're becoming more widespread. I saw a map earlier that mapped all those places that were the scene of demonstrations on the first day and the second day and the third day. And each day there were more demonstrations in more places. So if you go by that map and that data, it looks as if it's expanding in terms of numbers of places and also geographically throughout the country. Is there any sign of the government taking back control? There are reports coming in of more clashes throughout the country in various cities. We're talking about a dozen or so cities where there have been demonstrations. In at least three of them, we know that there have been clashes with the police, probably more. And it looks as if the police is trying to contain it. But I've noticed, for example, that the Revolutionary Guards haven't used the heavy-handed tactics that they are known for in Iran. And I suppose they are holding back for the moment for fear of provoking the demonstrators even further. Kazra Naji of BBC Persian. The Chinese leader, Xi Jinping, has used a speech to mark the new year to spell out his country's growing ambitions on the world stage. So did the speech provide any clues as to how those ambitions might be realised? A question for our East Asia editor, Michael Bristow. 
Xi Jinping, in his New Year's address, which he gave from what looked like his office, a picture of the Great Wall behind him, talked quite a lot about the domestic agenda, helping to alleviate poverty, about continuing the fight against corruption. But in this eight-minute address or so, the most notable aspect was China's, or what he saw as China's role on the global stage. Now, in the past, China has tended to hide itself away. Xi Jinping thinks China should take its place on the world stage and this comes at a time when President Trump really seems to be turning uh, America inwards. So what Xi Jinping said was essentially that the world is looking for a clear stance from China. As a responsible major country, China must speak out. We will staunchly safeguard the authority and the status of the United Nations and will ensure it fulfills its due responsibility and duty in international affairs. So, Michael, why is this happening now? Well, partly it's to do with the Chinese economy. It's grown tremendously. It's now the second biggest economy in the world, so China feels it has a lot more money to do what it's always perhaps wanted to do. In the past, it's had a number of grievances, a number of things that it wanted to do. It's wanted to reform the world order, but it just wasn't big or powerful enough to do that. Xi Jinping has obviously taken the opinion that now it, it is strong enough to try and reshape the order. He talked a lot in the speech about upholding the United Nations, upholding world order, tackling climate change, and China will do all those things, but also it looks to reshape how the world is organised as well. It's over recent years started its own development bank, it looks to reform the World Bank, it's ignored international judgments on the South China China Sea. Now it feels it has the power to be able to do what perhaps it's always wanted to do. So more diplomacy for China, but does this also potentially mean more military power outside China too? Well, interestingly, um, Xi Jinping, uh, in his speech, he talked about China launching its first homemade aircraft carrier. He says it's for defensive purposes, but many of the countries uh, around China and the United States will look at what's going on in China and think that perhaps it's going to use its military might in the future in order to push forward uh, changes uh, to the world order. So there will also be a, a section of politicians across the world which um, will be slightly worried about um, the direction China is heading in. Our East Asia editor, Michael Bristow. California starts the new year by becoming the largest state in the United States to legalise the recreational use of cannabis. Adults over the age of 21 can now possess up to 28 grams of the drug and grow six marijuana plants at home. Opponents say the new law will lead to more drug driving and will encourage young people to take up drug use. Supporters have complained about red tape. Our Los Angeles correspondent James Cook reports. Californians voted in favour of legalising cannabis on the same day that Americans elected Donald Trump as their president. In the 14 months since then, a complicated patchwork of taxes and regulations have been drawn up to govern sales of the drug. Critics say the red tape will discourage consumers, growers and retailers from leaving the state's vast black market and only a few dozen shops have so far been approved to open. The cities of Los Angeles and San Francisco have yet to sanction any recreational marijuana outlets. Still, California, with a population of nearly 40 million, is now the sixth state to legalise cannabis, which means one in five Americans can legally purchase the drug. Confusingly, the federal government still regards marijuana as illegal, classifying it alongside heroin and cocaine as a prescribed substance. Our Los Angeles correspondent, James Cook. Germany's Chancellor Angela Merkel has been under growing pressure since she failed to form a new Conservative-led coalition after the general election three months ago. So she took advantage of her traditional New Year's Eve television message to try to reassure her country that she will address growing social divisions, strengthen the European Union and focus on security and defence. We will more in a more strong state. We will have to invest yet more in a strong state which defends the rules of our living together and guarantees your safety, the safety of all of us. That's why I want to thank especially the police officers who will be there for us tonight and protect the many New Year's Eve parties in our country. Our Berlin correspondent Damien McGuinness listened to her speech and gave this assessment. Germany has no 
formal official government right now. There is a caretaker government. Uh, Mrs. Merkel is acting chancellor, but she's not actually been been sworn in as chancellor yet for the next four years. So it's quite an unusual time. So that's why she, in the speech, promised that very soon in the new year, a new government would be formed. If all goes well, if the talks with the centre-left Social Democrats, which is going to start on January 7th, if they go well, we could see um, a government in place by Easter. That would be sort of the earliest. If the talks don't go well, then it could be one of those less good options, which would leave Mrs Merkel severely weakened. So will Germans be convinced? Well, it depends really how the talks go over the next few weeks. Now, it's clear to everyone that Mrs Merkel does not want the uh, fresh elections, doesn't want a minority government, so she's going to do her best. That's, that's, that's clear, because any, anything else would, would be bad for her and be bad for her government. But the, the real problem is, are the Social Democrats, because they're severely weakened also by the a very poor election result. Their voters, many of their supporters and many of their members, say that the reason that they are so weak is because of the last time they shared a government as the weaker coalition partner with Mrs Merkel. Many of the, the party's members believe that left them severely burnt, which means they're very wary of, of getting into bed again with Mrs Merkel's centre-right party. So, so trouble so, with, her own, with, with her junior coalition partner, but there's also dissent within her own party, isn't there? Yeah, I mean, it's sort of rumbling away, really, because the, the problem for Mrs Merkel is just in the same way that the SPD, the Social Democrats, if they compromise too much, they're going to uh, lose the support of their left-wing members. It's exactly the same for Angela Merkel. If she compromises too much and gives in too much, she'll lose the support of her Conservative members and Conservative voters because she's also been accused of, over the last period in government, sharing, sharing a government with the centre-left, she's been accused of going too much to the centre and betraying the party's Conservative values. So she's got to really stick to her guns. So this is really the problem for both the centre-left and Mrs Merkel's centre-right that they've got to somehow stick to their values, keep their members and their voters happy, while at the same, the same time somehow compromising, because if they don't find a compromise, that would lead to a certain amount of instability in Germany, and by implication, with Germany being the largest country in Europe, also the European Union in general. Damien McGuinness. Thousands of tiny endangered turtles have been released back into the wild from a beach in the west of Mexico. Campaigners hope to raise awareness among local communities of the creature's dwindling population. This report from Claire McDonnell. Scores of local people gather on the beach in Concepcion Bamba in the Mexican state of Oaxaca to help with the release of the young endangered olive ridley turtles. At this stage they're so small they can fit neatly into a child's hand. Hundreds of thousands of the turtles usually land on these Pacific beaches as part of the annual egg laying migration. But as Silva Trinidad, a local conservationist who was involved in the release, explains natural predators and man-made problems are affecting their numbers. We have realized that the number of animals is going down in the ocean. Nets and gulls are always killing them. There have been four or five turtles killed daily in the morning. The other issue at play here is that the turtles' eggs are a traditional part of the local diet. Markets openly display them alongside turtle meat, despite laws prohibiting their sale. The turtles themselves have been slaughtered in their hundreds of thousands for centuries, and it's hoped that involving local families in the release of the turtles, while well, young people will want to protect them in the future, like this young girl. La she says, I released her into the sea. She went to the sea. She went to her house with her family. Claire McDonnell. You're listening to Global News, the most important stories and the best interviews and on-the-spot reporting from the BBC World Service. Every weekend you can hear a review of the week's main news stories and why they matter. That's in The World This Week and the programme is also available to download from our website www.bbc.co.uk forward slash programmes. Police and soldiers in the Democratic Republic of Congo have used force to block a planned rally calling for President Joseph Kabila to step down. Police say at least four people, including a police officer, were killed in the violence. Earlier, protesters, with priests walking amongst them, clapped and chanted. 
These people said they were fed up. Even under President Mobutu, which was a dictatorship, you could march peacefully. But today we just don't understand anymore. We're really tired of President Kabila. We are tired. We have never had peace in this country. Nothing works. We don't eat well. President Kabila is still young. He can leave his place to someone else and come back later if he wants. He has worked a lot already. It's enough. We don't want him. He should go and rest. Grant Ferret has been following the story. Tear gas and live ammunition as well have been fired by the security forces in a couple of locations in Kinshasa in the capital. There's been particular attention on one church in a district called Bandalungwa. Police there are reported to have interrupted a mass as it was being celebrated. One report I've read says choir boys were among those who were detained. Uh, a priest has been held at another church in Kinshasa. There have been roadblocks and tight security in the city since Saturday. The police had said that a planned rally, uh, which the church was going to be involved in, was not authorised and couldn't go ahead. Uh, the authorities also ordered the closure of internet services and uh, the blocking of text messages uh, across the country. Um, protests have been called elsewhere in DRC, but it's not clear so far if they've been heeded in other parts of the country. It was called by something described as the Catholic Laity Committee, so lay members of the church rather than the church leadership. Getting on for about half the population, 40 or so percent of the DRC is Roman Catholic, and the church played a, a central role in mediating a deal last year between President Joseph Kabila and the opposition. So the church has quite a bit of credibility in DRC. Under that deal last year, new elections should have been held by now. President Kabila should have stepped down. That deal hasn't been implemented, and we should remember too that Mr Kabila should, according to the constitution, have stepped down a year ago which is when the election should originally have been held. Grant Ferret. Characters from the children's television programme Sesame Street are going to be used to help teach children displaced by war in Syria. The Sesame Workshop and the International Rescue Committee have won a $100 million grant to help with the toxic stress suffered by many child refugees. Sarah Smith is the IRC Senior Director for Education and spent time recently visiting child refugees in Lebanon. She explained what's meant by toxic stress. When a person experiences multiple kinds of adversities such as displacement or poverty, hunger, violence, when they've witnessed very severe and adverse things that are associated with war, uh, their body essentially goes on high alert and what this means is that they have a flooding of hormones that happens essentially all the time in their bodies. So children often then appear agitated, they might appear withdrawn, they might also have a hard time regulating their emotions. If a child has toxic stress that goes untreated, these children as adults will have a harder time succeeding in jobs, they'll have a harder time having positive relationships, and they're also more likely to have health problems. Sherry Weston from the Sesame Workshop. We've had a long history of creating local productions and adaptations so that these characters will reflect a child's reality. They're not the U.S. version of the show. So, so let's imagine there's a new character in the, in the new production who perhaps had to leave her home or lives in a tent or becomes best friends with her new neighbor. All of these are designed to have storylines that children can relate to and characters that they identify with. And then it will not just be mass media. It will also be programs to go into homes and into schools with direct facilitation to reach the most vulnerable children. And what of the different languages that may be spoken by people in refugee camps? How do you accommodate all that? Well, all of our content will be done in both Arabic and Iraqi Kurdish, and it will be in Jordan, Lebanon, Syria, and Iraq. And, and one other point I would make is that you know, people think that most refugees are in camps, when in fact the vast majority of Syrian refugees are living in communities and neighborhoods side by side with their new neighbors. So we will reach them in camps, but also throughout the region. At times, clearly Sesame Street has frivolous moments. How much of that will be visible on the kind of program that you're describing? 
Well, there's a method to our madness. It, what you may refer to as frivolous, we would probably refer to as humorous. I was trying to choose my word carefully, but yes, <laughs> by all means, put me right. But no, that I think one of the other things people don't realize is that we've been around for almost 50 years, but Sesame was created to appeal to adults as well as children. That's why there were celebrities and humor and parodies, because if it worked on both levels, there was more chance of an adult watching with a child, which meant the learning would be greater. So that humor is very deliberate because we reach caregivers and adults as well as children and then you're becoming not only a tool to educate children but a catalyst for that important adult child relationship how much difference though realistically can it make if if a child is able to sit down and watch something like this and take it on board and be with the appropriate adults at that moment but then goes back out into the world which is still chaotic all around them, can it really make a big difference? Well, it can. We have, you know, everything that we're doing in this program is evidence-based. And we have research that shows that Sesame Productions in developing countries have learning outcomes, both academic and social-emotional, equivalent to a traditional preschool. But with mass media, that's at scale. But please understand what critical component of this initiative. We will reach a million and a half of the most vulnerable children, not through television, but through a home visitor going to their home with Sesame content on phones, printed books, materials, even small Pico projectors for classrooms, so that you're training the, t the parent and you're giving them tools to engage the child. And what it does is it helps them cope, it helps them build resilience skills, all of which are still going to help them no matter what they face later in life. Researchers in Britain have developed a new photographic scanning technique which they believe will help unlock the secrets of everyday life in ancient Egypt. The team at University College London say they can now read what was written on the scraps of papyrus used to make the decorated boxes enclosing mummies. Our science correspondent Palab Ghosh explains. The cases that mummies are contained in are made of old scraps of papyrus, which were used by ancient Egyptians for mundane matters, such as shopping lists or tax returns. They therefore give an insight into their everyday life. Until now, the only way to see what was written on them was to destroy these precious objects. Now, researchers have developed a scanning technique that leaves the cases intact but allows Egyptologists to read what's on the papyrus. According to Professor Adam Gibson of University College London, it's giving historians a new perspective on this remarkable period in our history. These now constitute one of the best libraries we have of waste papyrus otherwise would have been thrown away. So it includes things like you know, tax receipts and, and, and everyday information that, that we, would, we would nowadays throw away. Back then they would have thrown away, but it was fortunately it was recycled into these objects. There are hundreds of cases and masks that can be scanned, each one telling its own individual story of life in ancient Egypt. Palab Ghosh. As we start a new year, it's fun to speculate on which stories might make the headlines over the next 12 months. Our correspondent Alex Capstick has been looking at the world of sport and starts his predictions with a most unlikely entry at the upcoming Winter Olympics. Give it to me, Tuta! Uh, uh. <laughs> sport can be thrillingly unpredictable. A Nigerian bobsled team at the Winter Olympics might have seemed unthinkable. But in February, in Pyeongchang, this trio of women led by Sean Adigan will be sliding down the ice at around 130 kilometers per hour. It's been beautiful to know that Nigeria is supporting us. They've never had anyone in the Winter Olympics, and they're excited to see that happen. Nigerians globally, people that are even non-Nigerian, you know, just being supportive of the fact that this country is going to get representation at the Winter Olympics, and the continent's going to get representation in the sport of bobsled. Their adventure comes 30 years after Jamaica made history by qualifying for the men's bobsleigh. A movie, Cool Runnings, was made about it. Hollywood producers out there, here is your sequel. Now, a really interesting golf story to reflect on this morning because Tiger Woods is attempting another comeback in the Bahamas. Over yes, the I know, it's not days. the first time Tiger Woods has made a comeback, but this time it seems different. He showed more than a few glimpses of his old dominance on his return to competition at the start of December. 
It was a relative high at the end of a year in which he underwent make-or-break back surgery and was found slumped over his car steering wheel, spaced out on prescription drugs. So if Tiger Woods can continue his revival on the course and perhaps challenge for major honours, it would be a remarkable turnaround. Here are the thoughts of sports psychologist Amanda Owens. He's had an awful time. Yes, he's fragile, yes, he's vulnerable, like we all are as human beings, but he also has an unbelievable passion for the sport. Players, people can come back, and, and they do come back. There's a history of it. He needs to have the correct support around him, but I do believe that he will bounce back. He's, he has the ability, talent, and mentally very tough. There are things which lead me to think that maybe I, will, I can become even better driver or more complete driver than I was in the past. Motor racing, by its nature, is filled with fearless competitors. But this next story features an individual with breathtaking courage. In 2011, Poland's Robert Kibitzo, one of the fastest drivers in Formula One, was involved in a devastating crash. He did well to survive, but suffered life-altering injuries to his hand and arm. Last June, he was back on an F1 circuit testing for Renault. And now he's in contention for a place in the Williams team. If I come back, I don't want to do it just to come back. No, I need to be sure that I'm able at least to come as close as possible to the level I was before my accident. I feel pretty comfortable. I, I will be able to do it. So uh, that's that big step forward. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the number one player in the world, Serena Top of the rankings in the early part of 2017 until her season was pleasantly interrupted. The tennis star Serena Williams has given birth to a baby girl at a clinic in Florida. No name yet, but the news of There's the There's no certainty as, as to when, but baby. the indications are Serena Williams will return to tennis in 2018. She's one short of matching Margaret Court's all-time record of 24 Grand Slam titles. And sports psychologist Amanda Owens is confident the arrival of daughter Alexis Olympia Ahanian will not be a hindrance. I think she will be more driven. The research shows that athletes who have taken time out come back stronger, they're more resilient, and we'll see her performing even better in 2018. I think this will give her more meaning. And finally, we turn to the biggest sports event of the year, the World Cup and the Thunderclap. Yes, Iceland, with a tiny population of 335,000, will make history by becoming the smallest nation to compete in football's showpiece. The team will surely be tough. The fans, with their perfectly synchronised chanting, noisy. We will smile, we will sing and we will cheer and we will have a lot of fun. Iceland probably won't win the World Cup, but they'll provide the romance in Russia and they'll definitely be hard to ignore. Oh, from Iceland! Alex Capstick. And that's all from us for now, but an updated version of the Global News podcast will be available for you to download later. If you want to comment on this podcast or the topics covered in it, you can send us an email. The address is globalpodcast at bbc.co.uk. I'm Alex Ritson. And a very happy New Year from all of us who work on the Global News Podcast. Until next time, goodbye.